I beg your pardon. Well? Go on. I... Do I know you? Not intimately, I think. Well, who are you? A horseman. You've seen horses. Well, of course. That is, but this is a horse. I am a horseman. After all, a horse should be a welcome figure at your party. A little lecture on food. Some people eat horses. In a pinch, yes. Yes. Do you mind if I'm your guest tonight? Not at all. Do you mind if I have certain useful contributions to make to your program? Do you know anything about food from the Americas? I know everything about food. Everywhere. <laughs> your horse evidently doesn't. He's all ribs. I do not belong to the breed that fattens animals for the slaughter and for the gullets of men. I interrupt your story. Do go on. I intended to. Food. Subsistence and existence. Yes. Where there was the promise of food, men went. Where there was grass, tribes, nations, civilization went to feed their livestock, that their livestock might feed them. The rat and the ant have survived because they have known how, somehow, always to have food. The rat and the ant and man. Superlatively inspiring thought. But go on. When the rat and the ant compose a symphony or give testimony to God, let me know, man on horseback. Mm -hmm. Go on. Ever since the beginnings of man, his struggle for subsistence has been the story of his life. Interesting. His war and his peace, his hate and his love, his passions and his ideals. All is food. Man, the potent lord of creation, who lives only to eat. History and scriptures are full of the literature of meat and bread and the pitcher. And behold, Pharaoh did have a dream. He stood by the river, and there came out of the river seven kine, well-favored and fat-fleshed, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other kine came up after them, out of the river, and the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kine did eat up the well-favored and fat kind. And he sent for Joseph out of his dungeon, and Joseph told Pharaoh, This is the why for of your dream. There shall be seven years of great plenty in Egypt, but afterwards there shall be seven years of hunger in the land, and the plenty will be forgotten, and hunger shall consume the land. And Joseph told Pharaoh to store up his food in times of plenty, that there should be food enough in the lean years. <laughs> the devil can quote scriptures. Why can't I? Today, the world is at war. There is plenty where the torch is not put to the granaries in the fields. There is hunger where the armies, like locusts, swarm over the tortured land. Here in the Americas, the torch of war is not yet laid to the fields and bins and granaries. Can America, can this hemisphere alone feed its own and feed a world besides? No. Yes. Will we supply the world with food when it is hungry? Yes. Food. And is it hungry now? It starves. Then there will be food. You need ships to carry food. We'll have the ships. They will be sunk. We'll sink the sinkers. There'll be other ships. And where, tell me, is all this wealth of provender? All this food for yourself and for the rest of the world? Where is so much in the root and on the stock and on the hoof? We have some. We have much. And you, my optimistic friend, who are you? I am a gaucho, and I am only one of many, and there are many such many. I come from the great plains of the Argentine, from the white pampas. A, a cowboy, you would say, up here? I wouldn't. No. Not to you, perhaps, whoever you are, but the other one, the American, yes? Yes, my friend, I would. Ladies and gentlemen, a gaucho, a cowboy, if you please, from the plains of South America. 
the finest and beefiest beef on earth comes from those plains. Uh, it goes out in ships with ice, um, uh, how you call it? Uh, refrigerated. Uh, yes, and in cans, to where the armies are spread across the world. With the United States, with Mexico, with Uruguay, we have beef enough to feed the world. From the pampas to the huge slaughterhouses goes the beef. Then to be frozen and packed or tinned, and into the ships. Fanning out across the world, across the oceans, across the equator, past Iceland. Joining the quiet convoy. Watch out! Submarines! Cruising the deadly ocean into the cold, the icy waters of the northern seas. Archangel. Watch out, you fools! Dive bomber! Past submarine, past bomber and surface raider. Mermansk. You can't make it! The sea is sown with mine! Mermansk and we're in, boys. We're in with beef from the Argentine. The harbor is mine, I tell you. The sky is full of ruin. Trucks. The railroad taking the cargo... Taking the beef of the Argentine for the sinew of the Russian bear. Food, the ultimate fuel of the offensive. The army again, marching on its stomach. While the people march on their backbone, their nerve, and their knowledge that somewhere on the high seas the food is coming. Russia, Britain, China, Greece. Greece? We perish in our homes. We stiffen by the side of the home. Our eyes grow large and staring. And our ribs are hearts for death to play upon. Hmm. Our ribs are hearts for death to play upon. Mm -hmm. A skillful figure of speech inviting a sharp, clear picture of the truth. These Greeks are not bad. No, they're not bad at all. Making such words with hunger fall upon them. A worthy race. Descended from the gods indeed. Bravo, brave Greece. I do not care about the speeches that I make, except the world must listen and help us. Help. We cannot feed upon our bravery. Greece. Breakfast is warm water. Cold water would be torment to shrunken stomachs. Luncheon. Some blades of selected weeds and grasses, some stolen rancid oil. Dinner. A few olives. One has been lucky. And a spoonful of wheat flour. No. Beautiful for spacious skies, amber waves of grain. America. Wheat, bread, or we die. But the ships, there are no ships. There are ships. Not enough. For that, yes, there must be. Do you want your own people to go hungry? There is enough for all. Have I said you were a fool? Once, I think. You are twice a fool. Because I say there is enough to eat for all. Americans, north and south and central... Tell this stranger, tell this rider of a lean horse what you have to give and of your will to give. Talk about Argentina. You ought to have a look at Texas. American cowpuncher. Slightly different in dress from our friend the gaucho, but up to the same game with just about the same instruments. Rising with the sun, resting with the cattle, safely corralled for the night, not before. Using his rope like an artist, calling it a lasso. Or a riata. Short for Lariata, which is where we get the word lariat. But I prefer a rope. It's easier. Hard rope we call the boladero. I still like playing rope. It's easier. Rope, riata, boladero. Its aim is the same. Gaucho, vaquero, cowboy. The game is the same. To feed the world. And panhandle or pampas, the business is beef. More beef than you can count from now to the low Sierras. Cattle that move like a dark ocean across the prairies. Cattle as far as the eye can see. Millions of heads. Under the stars of the pampas, riding the range, seeing to the wire. Cowboy in America, riding the range, seeing to the wire. Singing his melancholy song, full of contentment, full of the doing of his appointed job. Let's talk about coffee now. Not exactly a food, but... Closer to it than a good after-dinner cigar, which makes a good dinner taste better and digest better, more than likely. There is more coffee in Brazil than the world can use. Hills of coffee, 
Slopes full of the coffee plants. Mountains of coffee beans. Coffee. Hot and piping. To warm the heart and lift up the spirit. The worker's wine. The soldier's companion. Across the vast sweep of the hemisphere, the farmlands lie open to the mercy or the malice of the zones. Manitoba, Canada, a farmer frowns at a head of wheat. Rust. I should have burned those Barbary bushes earlier. That's what spreads the rust. In the dry, difficult plateau of Mexico, a humble farmer rests on his worn spade. It is very hot. It is a world of other people's mouths and of his own pockets. And both need sorely to be filled. And the worn spade moves again. In Ohio, a young farmer violates tradition and neglects to say, I'll be switched. Instead, I'll have to see about an alkalizer for that old strip. It's much too acid. The hydrogen ion potential is way out of sight. The sky does not go unwatched. The waters are measured. The grain and the corn rise and are harvested. The soil surrenders to the farmer. This is your standard of achievement, then? This is the measure of your culture and your civilization, which you esteem so well and consider worth saving from starvation. An ocean of coffee channeling through your exalted system. <laughs> oh, these men. These worthy, worthy men. I just thought I'd show you that we set some store in what is not necessity. By way of showing that there's plenty and to spare. You'd uh, probably be interested in the more substantial things like beef. Consider the potato. Oh, yes. The potato. That dirty stone in the muck for men to scrabble at. The potato. Humble tuber. Let me see. To that miserable fleshy food that Sir John Hawkins took back to England from the New World, wasn't it? Oh, I can't tell you about the potato. It saved an entire people from starvation once. The more is the pity. See, here, you don't like people much, do you? The world is overcrowded. Let us return to the noble potato, savior of the people. All right. You tell me, and then I'll tell you. Sir John brought potatoes back to England. That wasn't really their name, but the white man couldn't pronounce so impossible a word as batata, which was their real name. It's too much for man's highly advertised culture. Go on. The potatoes landed in England, whereupon the English king, full of kingly sanctimony, the milk of human kindness, had them dispatched to Ireland as food and for further cultivation. The Irish, it appears, were starving to death. The uh, potatoes saved them and have continued to do so from time to time. And the Americas produce enough potatoes to feed every one of the United Nations once we get the bottoms and the wheels to ship them on. Potatoes uh, did a great deal to relieve the siege of Stalingrad. I myself have no particular liking for potatoes. You uh, develop a taste for them in besieged cities. <laughs> yes. And they're not bad with onions and gravy, convoyed by steak, hamburger, or leg of lamb, and some of that South American coffee. Remember? I don't care for potatoes. What do you care for? I have three comrades. Along with the horse, he said, too. Yes. Yeah. If they're all like you, you can have them. They are very much like me. But I thank you for them. Take a look around you from a train window in the Plain States. Or from that saddle on your emaciated horse, mister. And see a heap of corn on the stalk. All kinds. Corn, maize. Ranks and ranks of it. High, full, strong, full of starch, sugar, calories. The fields of waving grain you may have heard about in that song. Wheat, then corn, wheat, and more corn. Planted in strips, planted with tricks and savvy by Americans who've learned how to get the best out of corn. 
and the best out of the soil that corn grows on by rotating crops and rebuilding the earth that the corn breaks down. Corn being the sinewy, substantial stuff that it is, it takes a lot out of the soil. But American farmers have what it takes, and they put it back again. And that's why there's enough of it to go around. It didn't just grow. It was out there and nursed and kitted and persuaded and browbeaten up to where it is today. It took know-how in the United States and Illinois, in Iowa and Nebraska. And it took know-how and savvy in Argentina, where the corn grows tall and the corn grows numerous. American farmers in the Americas had to whisper sweet something to those big golden ears of corn. They got corn. A whopping big lot of corn. Enough and more than enough to go around. The Americans. The Americans. You, uh, <clears throat> find something gravely wrong with them? I reserve my privilege to despise them. I hate the fat lushness of America. That ain't fat, mister. That's muscle, evenly distributed. Beautiful, spacious skies. Amber waves of rain. That's right. Wheat. Bread wheat. Macaroni wheat. Mm -hmm. Club wheat. Mm -hmm. Lots of wheat. And anything under a billion bushels a year is strictly bush league these days. Mountain majesties. The fruity plain. <laughs> Lyrical. You don't care for oranges and vitamin C. <clears throat> you hate apples I and do. pears and peaches. And you're not happy in the Santa Clara Valley. You probably think George Washington did exactly right when he chopped down the cherry tree. I reserve my privilege to hate at my pleasure. Well, you certainly are having a lot of fun, whoever you are. And I repeat, I hate America. Will I find out why? Perhaps. I should happen to lose my temper. Maybe this will do it. I don't know. Bananas. Bananas. Yes, we have no bananas. Bananas were brought up from Central America as an experiment. They were a smash heap. Overnight. We are not amused. Nuts. I beg your pardon. Uh, nuts. One South American nut that you won't approve of, mister, because it's very well liked by plain people, is the cocoa. They make cocoa chocolate from the nibs of the cocoa bean. Chocolate is one of the greatest items in the diet of the entire world. As a delicacy. As a delicacy for a decadent people that are better off dead. As a food, then, for millions of people. As a source of quick energy and chocolate bars for soldiers. Purposely made unpalatable so that the soldiers won't eat them unless they really have to. Civilization going really mad. Americans alone drink 2,730,000,000 cups of chocolate every year. Oh, how interesting. Mm -hmm. Gives you the uh, haunting idea that there must be an awful lot of cocoa in Brazil. Enough to count in the whirlpool. That's 170,625,000 gallons of chocolate. Oh, hum. Oh, hum, indeed. But a fleet of super battleships, 16 in number and weighing over 40,000 tons, each could be floated on that much chocolate. Could it indeed? Well... It could. Manner of speaking, maybe it will. Maybe it will. Shredded coconut comes from down there, too, and we use the coconut shell in making gas masks. America is where someone once took a chance and ate the vegetable called a love apple and found out by the horn spoon... It wasn't poisonous after all. We call it a tomato today, and its juice is a cheap and potent source of natural water, soluble vitamin. For a world that doesn't precisely reek with vitamins, where they're needed most urgently, most pathetically, and where by the grace of God and the watchfulness of a few tin cans and corvettes, they're arriving because we have a lot of tomatoes that we know what to do with. All over the Americas, tomatoes are numerous. There are no tomatoes in Europe that we don't send. They're as American as covered wagons and a short left jab. Only more helpful. Are you quite finished? No champion of the groaning board. Is the rhapsody concluded? Have you sung enough of the Americas and their preoccupation with their own innards? Those of all the world? Have the men of ideals and ideas had enough to eat? We haven't heard from Chile yet. 
These people out here are going to be interested in knowing, I think, that the famous chili bean has a lot in common with all the tall, strapping men who are called Tex, because they've never been to Texas. Chili beans are most largely produced in the United States. Hence, they're called chili beans. Now, I know my unhappy friend here who rides a meager horse disapproves of this kind of talk, but... Mm-hmm. I've stopped trying to understand a man who says he hates Americans. I do. Who says he hates all the Americas and the whole Western Hemisphere. I do. Venomously. Bubonically. You said you'd like to make some contributions to the discussion of the Americas as the provider. After you, great champion of your people. Cuba. Mm -hmm. And the Cubans. They're Americans. And you're at liberty not to like them either. And the Cubans are at liberty to be at liberty. Cuba is the world sugar bowl. And in a way, sugar set Cuba free. Even before 1898. The thick Cuban sugar cane is cut with a murderous looking instrument called a machete. A machete charged by those liberty loving Cubans was a terrible thing to see. So the Spaniards didn't stay around to see it. The Western Hemisphere can feed the world. It has quantity, it has infinite variety. The limits of both have never been tried. There is no philosophy beyond the facts. Others need, we have. We are richly able to share. We do share. We must share more. We shall. That is the simple progression. If it is broken, we are broken. For more and more we live for and by our fellows in this world. We can reenact the miracle of the loaves in modern dress. So that it becomes the science of the loaves. Man does not live by bread alone. But without bread at all, he also perishes. Challenge, challenge, challenge. You speak so much of golden grains that you yourself become mealy mouthed. All right. Out with it then. What do you challenge, man on a lean horse? That your precious man does not live by bread alone. <laughs> he does. And by nothing else. He lives for the sweat of his brow. For the satisfaction of his stomach. You put it more simply before. You said he lives to eat. And nothing more. Exalted oratory, notwithstanding, the Lord of creatures is himself a creature. Created only to experience a few brute senses. Then to perish. Why are you trying to make it seem otherwise? To set a higher purpose for the miserable species. The grubbing nature of the beast is so apparent. Just apparent to me. Because you're one of them. A slug, a snail, a primitive. The turkey gobbling through the field of locusts. Concerned only and completely with eating and digestion. What do men do, these... Pretenders to divinity. They kneel and scrabble in the muck, planting and growing to eat. All other ends are nothing. Only eat. Feed the organism. Nourish the insistent cells. Then languish in a stupor of appeasement until hunger comes again. Then eat. Nourish oneself. Oh, it's unhappily necessary to nourish the earth first. The earth. Made up of death. Since the world began. They dabble about in the mud. Raking in foul things that send a stench to high heaven. Nod and smirk at each other. And say, we enrich the soil. This is a good thing that we do. No. I don't like anything you've said tonight. It's man's individual destiny what becomes of him. No. Hands off policy. Isolationist, huh? 
If man must perish, then he must. Why change things? He's marked for starvation. Let him starve and be done with it. It's not as important as you make him out to be. Not by far. I disagree. As I disagree with you. As I abhor the things you fancy. As I revile your amber waves of gray. And your fruited plains. And your babble and prattle of plenty. Your continents and their meddlesome fertility. I hate them. For they are wasteful and prodigal, contrary to the law of survival, of selection. I tell you, I hate America, for I am famine. I am the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. I am famine. And America is my enemy.